Hello everyone, thanks for joining me again for one of these Ask the Expert webinars. Today's Q&A is on a subject that I'm really interested in and have been interested in for a, for a long time. Uh, this is with Paul Larson, who's an endurance coach. He's a high performance consultant. And as most of you all know, he's an expert in high intensity interval training having worked with many elite athletes as a practitioner, and he's also worked within academia and published several studies on high intensity interval training and co-authored the what's now the sort of seminal textbook of high intensity interval training. He's also the co-founder of HIT Science, which is a high intensity interval training education provider. Paul's also uh, the co-creator or the creator of Athletica, which is an AI coaching app that helps to create individualized training plans. And that's something we might come on to as we go through the questions in today's webinar. And what I'll do is I'll include links to Paul's book and the resources I've just mentioned in the summary email, email that I'll send uh, at the end of this webinar. So I'll Quite a few of my guests, Paul, also kindly contributed to my book on the high intensity interval training chapter, um, which focused on functional uh, high intensity interval training. And the question has actually just come in about that. So it's something that we uh, might cover. So uh, thanks uh, for joining us, Paul. Really appreciate you giving up your time. Um, is there anything I've missed out that you'd like to add on your background or what you've got going on at the moment? Oh, Paul, that was pretty. Thanks so much again for having me. As uh, you know, as a um, co-author or a yeah co-author in as a for a book chapter in your book. Um, yeah, we're grateful to be involved. And no, I think you hit it pretty good there. And yeah, I'll continue to uh, plug a few of my little little activities as we as we go along. But that was great. Thanks, man. Cool. No problem. Okay, so selfish. I'm going to start with. Um one of uh, my own questions. So I've been interested in high intensity interval training for many years. So I've, I've done it myself uh, in my training, used it with athletes and also uh, with, with clients as well when I was personal training. But one of the um, kind of misconceptions that I often find many athletes make and particularly members of the public um, when they do high intensity interval training is that they think it has to be done as hard as possible all out. So I just wanted to ask you, Paul, in your experience, what would you say is the biggest misconception you come across with high intensity interval training? And how do you go about educating athletes and coaches that harder is not always better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that is the, I mean, you, you, you've hit all the main points there and the listener is, uh, probably getting it, but it's not about the no pain, no gain philosophy that is prevalent within our industry. Um, and um, that's just not the best way to, it's not the best road to roam, for lack of a better term. You can do much better if you hit the target and walk away. So Martin and I always say in our book, you know, you should always leave a session like you could have done one or two more efforts. There is, and, and there's so many different ways to do high intensity interval training. And maybe just for, we should just start with reviewing the basic definition for anyone who's listening. And that is, you know, it's exercise intensity that it is above your, you know, your, it's, it's in your red zone. It's above your threshold, your, your anaerobic threshold. Um, it, it's, um, it, it needs to be above that critical power or critical speed to actually be considered hit, but there's a lot, there's still a lot of room to grow and move across that spectrum above your threshold, as you can imagine. And, um, you know, you've, you'll, you'll be aware in our book and course we teach, there's gen generally five different key types of, of hit exercise that we can do above that including um including you know long intervals that are just sort of you know at right about 100 percent of your vo2 max short intervals are kind of moving at about 120 percent of vo2 max um, and then we kind of move into those all-out ones that you just spoke on repeated sprint training or um or sprint interval training so yes you can do all of those there's also game-based interval training too and we integrate the um 
you know, the team sport elements or games into, in, into the, the, the hit training, but yeah, all, all of that, it doesn't have to be all out. You don't have to do these to exhaustion. And in fact, you're hurting yourself if you do these to exhaustion because it, you're preventing yourself ultimately from picking back up again tomorrow and going again. We know that consistency of training in any sport is a, the fundamental a factor that is going to lead you to success. So whatever you do today, keep in mind tomorrow because you want to pick back up and do something again tomorrow or the next next day. And if you go, if you go all guns blazing, no pain, no gain, right to the end, you get injured, you get sick um, or sore, and you're going to prevent that consistency principle. So yeah, I hope I answered that question generally. Yeah, re re really well. And, and thanks for kind of summarizing the different types of high intensity interval training, because some of the um, audience might not be aware that there's this sort sure. of continuum of uh, HIT, um, often, uh, particularly, I suppose, because it's more mainstream now, HIT is used a lot on, on social media, isn't it? And you see sort of these protocols, which um, are basically all out all of the time and, uh, that often gets um, sort of misconstrued that you have to train that way. And so it's useful yeah. for people that aren't of the a background in um, high intensity interval training to know that there is a different types and maybe we'll come on to sort of why that's the case and what you would term your sort of physiological targets. Uh, so I'll, I'll go on to the, um, the next question, which is a generic one, which I often get asked um, and it'd be interesting to hear your, your take on this because these generic questions um, are often quite difficult to uh, answer without asking for more information. But anyway, let's see. Um, so this comes from Dom and he, he asks, um, do you have a personal favorite HIT protocol? If not, what is a good generic protocol for developing aerobic capacity? Yeah, in the context of HIT, uh, if I had to pick one that I've found the most safest, it tends to be a short interval uh, program of, you know, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, off you know, a variety of, of efforts there, then, then you know, um, hit with a, uh, or then, you know, recover for like a, with a, a series of, you know, steady state exercise between, and then repeat that again. It's just a, it's a blend in my experience of, and you know, and the intensity of this is usually sitting between 100 and 120 percent of your you know, your VO2 max or the speed that you get at the end of a progressive exercise test. Um, it's, again, I'm, I'm being, context is always key. Yeah. But if I had to sit hit one that develops aerobic capacity nicely um, and also is generally speaking, not too taxing, that's sort of my go-to protocol. And we can use it across a variety of different uh, exercise, exercise as well. I could use it with cyclists. I could use it with runners. Uh, I could use it in team sports. Uh, it's, you know, it can be one of those ones that can be done within 30 minutes. If you, you know, if kind of done right brief, brief five to 10 minute warm up, and then, uh, you know, a, a couple sets of 30 thirties cool down and you're done. So yeah, I guess it, there's my, that's sort of my go-to, my go-to recipe um and yeah there's uh there's even been a few studies that have like compared the 30 you know uh, a 30 30 short interval workout versus a long interval and it tends to be um it tends to be very effective uh and and e in general when we're looking at a group team tends to have the the better outcome uh, i will say it's again very context dependent and we can have different uh, phenotypes or profiles, a twitchy, twitchy person versus a diesel person. And uh, it, it, they tend to respond, um, you know, they'll, um, you know, it, it, depending on the, the individual that we have in front of us, they could go just as well on that longer interval. Um, but the 3031 tends to work almost for both, both for our diesel engine guys or slow yeah. twitch guys or the twitchy, uh, um, fast twitcher, you know, to profile individuals, and uh, it it tends to, to usually hits all the all all the spectrums of the different phenotypes. But I'm generalizing there, and again, I would always cater it to the individual that's in front of me first and foremost. Sure. So the, I, I um, yeah agree. That's um, the sort of shorter 
um, aerobic type interval is a nice approach. Um, one thing that I sometimes find athletes struggle with is setting the or getting the initial intensity right because when you program 30 seconds i found that often they go off too hard because it's a short bout particularly if they're using heart rate as well because they try and get the heart rate up but there's of course that lag so without so say when working with an athlete that's not a cyclist doesn't have a power meter do you have any sort of ways of setting or regulating the intensity of those 30 second blocks in the initial sort of first few reps yeah so i mean it really depends on the tools at your disposal right whether mm. you've got uh, but the, the one tool that we all have is our feel so we've yeah. all got our mind we can and we're we're um you know following a little bit of a warm-up what you'll find usually is those first uh um you almost like you're warming up the fast twitch muscle fibers so usually out of the gates it won't be crazy high compared to what you're going to get going to get after a little bit of priming warming effect uh you know hormones are rising and all those sorts of things yeah we tend to see you know if we actually look at these profiles power or speed it kind of goes like this like this like this and then rest and then the ne the second set of these is 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 right up there um in terms of gauging them with your mind it's like the feel is hard, so but not too hard. Like you're not, so, you know, kind of back to your first question, you're not like screaming, you're not just yeah. like, don't scream out of the gates. You don't want to have like a sprint profile and then just kind of going down. You're trying to, and, and some of this takes a bit of trial and error yeah. and, uh, and mind control and familiarity, right? So you're not always great at these, out of, you know, right. If, the, if you're doing these for the first time, um, but yeah, it should just be like, and, you know, you warm into these things if you're doing 30 seconds hard and, and then the heart rate profile, like you, that was kind of your key question. It's not going like this. It's not spiking like the power right. and the, and the speed it's kind of, it's more slowly rising and steady. And then in the, in the recovery set, like you're doing like a, um, a series recovery kind of, uh, um, you know, set, uh, sorry, after the set of, of, of repetitions, you're, you might be like riding easy, steady for two to five minutes between the next set of these bouts. And then the heart rate will fall down again. In fact, actually, like the heart rate profile doesn't look too different compared to a long interval versus a short interval. The heart rate profile is kind of more steady, like more steady, because even during that 30 seconds of off or just yeah. turning over the legs or walking if you're running it, the heart rate still stays high you're still getting adaptations to the cardiovascular system and this is the the really cool advantage of of hit training is that even during those recovery bouts you're still getting those cardiovascular adaptations so it's quite a um a, you know it's a super cool uh format ultimately in the yeah i find time. that quite an interesting when you look at heart rate traces of the short intervals particularly sort of if you're doing that sort of series approach the the final couple of series it almost looks like they've done a long continuous interval like a three or four minute one just because the heart rate recovery isn't coming down so it's sort of just like a squiggly line it's never really recovering because some fatigue is built up and heat etc um, so it is interesting. I found that um, athletes, I don't know about you, have found that quite useful to, to see their heart rate response after the training. So they can kind of say, oh, actually, even though I was taking those breaks, uh, my heart rate was still elevated and, you know, I'm still getting a good cardiovascular effect. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and you really, you know, if you're listening to this first time, not that experience with it, you should really try to get some wearables uh, if you can, you know, and power, power if you're a cyclist or a rower, um, speed if you're, a, if you're a runner, and then the heart rate as well, map them simultaneously and have a look for yourself. It, it is really, it's, it's quite, it's, it's quite cool. If we, we like, if we like geeking out and, you know, if you're here, you're probably like us and you like, yeah, exactly. you like geeking out on this sort of stuff, so. Yeah, I expect most people uh, listening in or have got wearables or at least a heart rate monitor. Um, I'll come on to the next one, which is uh, I mentioned when we were uh, sort of before we went live, Paul, that we got a mixture in the audience of of practitioners working with high end athletes, and then people working with sort of members of the public and just general fitness enthusiasts. And this one is geared more towards the latter. This comes from Zach, and he's asked a really interesting question, and that is, uh, 
do we know if there's a minimum effective dose of HIT? I train clients who have limited aerobic fitness. Do you think a total of 10 minutes, and he's put in brackets, 10 times one minute interval program, a couple of sessions per week, would this be effective or could even less volume work? Yeah, nice, nice question, Zach. Again, it really, really, really depends on the individual that you have in front of you. I mean, um, you know, we've got, you, you can just imagine all, all the different types, right? Um, uh, so, you know, I, I don't know if there's a, a unfortunately, there's not a one size fits all. We all want that one size fits all approach. But this is where you as a practitioner, uh, as you develop more experience in time, you will, you'll get, you'll get better at coaching for that individualness. And then you'll have these, uh, you'll, you'll have these different sort of concepts that, that are in your mind to do this. But honestly, um, I would want to see probably a baseline level of uh, aerobic movement um, yeah. first in the in terms of a foundation for that individual so um although the, I, I will say you know cycling is a very safe one because of the concentric um you know the concentric movements and concentric muscle patterns of cycling relative to say running so if we did if we were doing this in the running context yeah. where someone is you know uh obese or frail uh, low fitness, that 10 by one minutes could destroy them. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, and then, you know, even cycling, like that could be too hard for a certain individual. So you really have to gauge, really use some common sense and like have a look at what's, what's in front of us here. Uh, try to develop a little bit of a, an aerobic base first before, but then to your point, yeah, like start adding in some high intensity work because we know that we can uh, recruit the larger fast twitch muscles. We know that um, we, we just talked about the cardiovascular adaptations that we can get in a short period of time. They're fantastic. And, and yeah, um, but use the principle of progression as well too, right? 10 by one minutes could be too hard for the certain individual. Could be bang on for someone else. So, um, other, you know, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know if that answered that question, but it no, really- No, I, I, I think really it does. It's actually, um, if I remember rightly, I, I included a, a case study in, in my book, which sort of was asking a similar question to that is, is well, when should you introduce HIT basically? And I completely agree with what you've just said. I, I would always say that it's, it's with someone, a client or an athlete that you haven't trained before, to establish some form of aerobic base with continuous training first so they can become intuitive with their sort of regulating intensity because I, I did make that mistake as a PT many years ago is that um, I might have reached straight away for the the uh, hit um, hammer so to speak mm -hmm. and then because the client wasn't sort of didn't have that conditioning they couldn't really recover from the first couple of bouts so then the training tended to be more of a sort of a continuous session in the end because they just weren't able to hit the pit hit the peaks and troughs and so I, yeah. I completely agree with what you're saying you, you really can't you have to gauge it on a person by person basis um and see what the how the client's responding and what their history is before you can kind of make those specific calls yeah but it, it's i mean to look at it another way like maybe we're coming at this from more of the strength and conditioning um sort of side of things you wouldn't do a max like one RM bench mm. press for someone that right out right out of the gates and they have no experience with that, right? Think about it. You would, you know, if you they wanted to develop bench press, um, you would get them moving or doing some push-ups or some modified push-ups or these sorts of things. You'd actually, and it's the same sort of principles too with with the hit. So we've got to be moving first and uh, developing the appropriate motor patterns. And uh, just, yeah, be cautious as a trainer straight into the gates of, of, of doing anything that's explosive. And right back to the, where we started with this whole thing with the no pain, no gain concept. Sure. Away from that and um, leave all of these sessions like you could do one, one more. Get that client coming back to you as well, right? If you're, if you're hurting them and they're absolutely exhausted after these, these sorts of things, then, they're, yeah, they're not going to come back to you. And, um, 
Yeah, I mean, and, and I've learned I've learned this the hard way myself. Um, my in my coaching world, I have uh, not been explicit enough with my instructions, even my online coaching with uh, professional top 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 uh, triathletes and stuff in the world, and uh, haven't given them the you know really those instructions to be able to walk away like you could have done one or two more of the whatever your it is your programming. So and, and going back to that that previous question um about sort of the regulation of intensity i suppose that's an a, a good way a retrospective way if you couldn't complete the session you've gone too hard pretty much haven't you yeah it, absolutely absolutely that is yeah fundamental one right because it's almost like because you must be close to exhaustion right it's almost like and you should never be in in our exercise science we a lot, a lot of times we look to these studies that we do in the exercise sciences and the research I'm guilty of this myself, having done many of them, but we've look, we look to time to exhaustion tests or intervals to exhaustion. And in practice, you'd never actually go and do that, right? No. Um, you're, or you shouldn't, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be doing your, your hit work to exhaustion. You should be leaving, leaving, um, leaving energy in the tank so that you can back up tomorrow and repeat the whole process again. You'll get a way better, better outcome. You'll, you'll, you'll speed your, uh, progression to developing your, um, you know, readiness to perform performance capacity, which is what we all want. Yeah, for sure. And it, it's really interesting because a, a couple of uh, Q and A's ago, um, I uh, did one with uh, Stephen Siler and um, this theme about intensity and even how elite athletes train, the, there's a misconception that it's always really hard. And of course he introduced sort of the polarized training and we went through that and discussing that concept. So um yeah you're kind of like as you would expect like the experts uh are mirror, uh, kind of saying the same things um which yeah. uh yeah, is interesting we, unfortunately um for right or wrong martin and i became through our research we became experts in high intensity interval training and then we branded our um our our business hit science and unfortunately just because of hit and it's the belief, like you started out, no pain, no gain. We get that, um, we kind of get that thought initially when people come to hit science. They naturally will think no pain, no gain. Yeah. And, um, and that's, of course, not where, where we're, we're, we're exactly on the, the 100% same page as Steven Seiler. Like you've got to hit on top, built on top of solid aerobic base. Uh, foundation um, established movement patterns is the icing on the cake that we do want. So we're, we're all in the, we're all preaching the same um, uh, choir, we're preaching in the same choir, but it's, uh, yeah, it's just a, it's a little bit unfortunate for us sometimes that people think that it before they come to us, that's just what they'll, they'll believe. But anyways, it is what it is. Yeah, I suppose it's it's kind of ironic that um like to coin the the term polarized that some people are like either hit or they're sort of like zone two when in in actual fact it's um athletes don't like have one approach or the other it's it's a combination of of, yeah. of uh, training intensity types. It is actually I mean I'm not sure if you know of Phil Maftone he's our colleague he wrote chapter seven the health chapter. Yeah. And well, Phil Maftone, he's coined like math training, maximal aerobic function. And his, from the endurance standpoint, he, you know, he trained, uh, he was the coach of Mark Allen, who's six time Ironman winner for, for Kona and other triathletes back in the, in the nineties. And it was all like his, the, what people believed about Phil Maftone's training was it all, it was all zone two mm. or sub zone two training. And, and that was his recipe. And yes, that was a big, big part of it. And that was what those athletes needed because they were always doing too much hit. But of course, he also used hit as well. So just like, just like you said, um, you, you're looking for the balance. You're looking for the balance of these and you're looking for training consistency. So um, you really, if you're, if you're coming into this field for the first time, you want a blend of all these different things and philosophies that you that you see around. You probably don't want to. You probably don't want just a single one. Yeah, and, and like you touched upon with the resistance training example, it's it's the same in, in in that type of training. You wouldn't just stick with the same exercises and the same repetition range with the same rest periods. You you kind of periodize and, and, and mix it up um, in a sort of systematic way, and it's the same for 
endurance training and conditioning um but anyway I'll, 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 i've got quite a few questions i'll go on to the next one um which um is a little bit more specific um and he's included some detail which is always good when when we get um questions so they're not too generic so toby asks uh, when programming three to four minute intervals uh, what would be a guideline for the maximum number of reps you would prescribe for a fairly well-trained runner? And he's put in brackets, his VO2 max is around 60. Is there an upper limit of effectiveness? And I presume he means a certain amount of um, reps. Yeah. Um, now, this again, it comes back to that individual, right? So, yes, you, you've given me a 60... 60 VO2, um, but you know, I don't know if this individual is just uh, just starting in with these, uh, you know, these these three to four minute intervals. Uh, three to four minute intervals in our context are considered long intervals, mm -hmm. and typically we run these around, you know, 90 percent, 95 percent of VO2 max, and um, they're a great top up. Um, they're also Toby. They're they're good for some individuals, and they'll bin others. So this kind of comes back to what we call the phenotype. The phenotype is the unknown at this point uh, fiber type makeup. Whether an individual is possessed uh, possesses a lot of slow twitch muscle fibers, we call these guys diesel engines. They go and go and go. And if that's the case, um, then that individual. Toby could probably handle, you know, it, it'll depend on where they're at, but they could handle three to, to eight of those uh, three to four minute intervals, um, depending on how well trained they are. Conversely, unfortunately, if they're a twitchy individual, um, they might be binned after one or two of those, those intervals. And that's really, that's what we're dealing with. So it's, there's unfortunately no one size fits all. And this is where the importance of monitoring um, comes into place and really getting in touch with how things are feeling and being honest with those those feelings, whether that feels right or not. Um, so yeah, I, I probably didn't answer the question so well, but that's the truth. Yeah, you give a, a, a rough range there. And um, I think everyone who's attended these before knows that, because um, I have various experts on and, you know, they always ask and make the point about context and, adding caveats so I, I don't think anyone's going to be sort of expecting a you know, like no 10 is the the maximum number um just yeah, go, back, to, go back to go back to initially where we started to right leave leave that whoever you are you're 60 vo2 we do and you're starting you can you can leave three um three of those intervals and you could feel like you could do one or two more then you're leaving at the right time feel you know go to four if you feel like you as long as you're cutting back when you could do do one or two more after. If you're doing that, um, you're probably hitting the hitting the mark for the adaptation. Walk away. Repeat the repeat something else tomorrow. And don't be too sore. And just going back to so in in um, your books and um, hit science use this uh, terminology of different types where we've got uh, type one being very aerobic, uh, sort of high aerobic stimulus, low neuro, uh, neuromuscular stimulus, no uh, low glycotic stimulus. Uh, glycolytic rather um the three to four minute bout where would this sit is this a type three slash type four type session would you say you got it type three and type four so you're either you're either high aerobic anaerobic um and uh either neuromuscular or not neuromuscular is uh, that not neuromuscular is type three uh, with neuromuscular stimulus all guns blazing is we, we say that's type four um, in terms of all those targets being hit, typically in the running context, we've got a lot of neuromuscular stimulus because of the eccentric neuromuscular musculoskeletal stress that you get with that uh, eccentric based, um, you know, um, running movement. If you do that in the cycling context, those three to four minutes intervals you probably have a type a type three response. You're lessening the neuromuscular musculoskeletal strain on that workout. Cool. And, and if anyone's wondering about types, if, you, if you've not read Paul and Martin's book, then um, I'd suggest um, having, having a look at uh, checking that out because it explains it really well in terms of the different types of stimulus that each type of hit will uh, induce. Um, so I'll go on to the next question from uh, Jack. 
a uh, former student of mine is now working with high performance athletes, which is really, really good to see. Um, so he has asked a couple of questions, and you've just actually hit upon one of his uh, questions, actually. Um, is it possible to program HIIT training based on muscle fiber type in athletes? And is this achievable in a squad environment or only applicable when working with individual athletes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a great question. And I think on, honestly, Jack, we need a lot more work in this area. Uh, I would refer you to Gareth Sanford's work in um, the anaerobic speed reserve. There's a, there's a lot of blogs as well. You can see on hit science where we talk about both the anaerobic speed and power reserve and how to individualize training accordingly. And um yeah, this. So to answer your question in the individual setting, it's much, it's certainly much easier. Um, it is, you can look at uh, anaerobic speed and uh, reserve where you're looking at their sprinting speed and you're comparing the, um, how their sprinting speed compares to their maximal aerobic speed. Um, you know, as a surrogate, you know, between 1500 meters and three, 3000 meter uh, run. Um, or VO2 max. Um, so how how much sort of gap do you have? Like are they, if they're in a really twitchy athlete, their sprinting speed is going to be really high, right? And then um, depending on the the lower end of the spectrum there, the the VO2 that's going to really um, depend on. That's going to give us insight into how wide that uh, reserve sort of hits, and that reserve relates to you know, um, yeah, your, your, your fiber type makeup, we think, and how well you will handle and recover from these types of intervals where our diesel engines with high VO2 maxes, they tend to be very resilient and, but they're not as explosive. And, uh, conversely, the, um, the twitchy guy is with the big, you know, the big reserve, but not so much of the aerobic, um, resiliency. They're super explosive. Um, but they're, you're going to bend them. So, um, in the, yeah. And it, it sounds like Jack's aware of that, but, um, yeah, so it's in the individual context, as you start to understand the athletes, it's pretty, um, it's, it's good to see that in the area and you can, you can individualize for the single individuals to Jack's point. It's not so easy in the, um, team or group context. And this is where, you know, you might have to do something in the team sport context. You could do something like Martin's 3015 IFT pro protocol, potentially, where you're, you're mapping out what looks like, because the IFT, the 3015 IFT, it, um, it gets insight into the, um, the anaerobic speed reserve of those players. And then you can, um, you can program uh, your hit sessions accordingly. Um, based on that. So for anyone that, uh, again, go to 3015.com and you can download Martin's free app to, um, to be able to cater for, I think he's got four different, um, four different types of team sports that are on there. Um, just, it covers just about all of them. And then there's a yeah, free app as well. You can download and um, yeah. I'll, and I'll include that in the email. Yeah. That's really yeah. useful. Um, Thanks for that. Yeah, um, so that's that, that's that. And then, but yeah, in the, like it really depends on the context of what Jack's looking for, whether he's looking for team sports or like a group of runners. I, uh, I, I think he's working with rowers. Mm. Rowers, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah, I don't think we have one specifically for rowing yet. This is It's interesting because back to um, one of the um, things that I told you I was going to plug and that's Athletica. We're actually mm -hmm. working. So athletica.ai, check that out. And uh, we're actually working on um, developing this into our app so that you can actually get insight into what your profile looks like. You're um, based on just your wearable data. And then we're going to, you know, we're, we're working on protocols so that the, the, your the the hit program that comes from it is related to your phenotype so that'll probably be version three of the app we're not there yet but that's that's our that's our goal because it's to jack's point it's a it's a really important question that 
no one's really got a great handle on yet. Because the research really is just, even though coaches have known this for decades, um, the main, it's really only come to mainstream in the last five years, to my knowledge. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting area that, um, you yeah, know, hopefully see a lot of emerging research in. And on this um, question of um, profiling and looking at the anaerobic speed reserve, I've used this a couple of times. And what, say we're looking at team sport athletes, um, sometimes you'll get an athlete that doesn't really score well on either. They just kind of sit in the middle. Um, so they, there's no obvious where kind of, like they, there's no obvious kind of area that they have to focus on because they're sort of mediocre on both is in that in those instances what would you tend to sort of look more at would you look at more top end stuff um or sort of building more of an aerobic base yeah it, it totally depends it's great um i think that's that's the majority i think we, the majority of us fall within the hybrid profile you know mm. we've got a little bit of both that's, that's certainly me Personally, I'm a I'm a hybrid kind of athlete, and that that even suits my my background. I love sport and did everything, so I was I was decent at team sports, um, and then I went into um, I went into endurance sports because but I had I had a little bit of both in, in me, and um, yeah, how do you program for that? Well, again, if you're it depends on the context. My position, uh, for example, and like I guess, I guess you know you look at the demands of the particular let's say we're dealing with a a, a box-to-box midfielder in football and they've got like that sort of mediocre um maximal aerobic speed and mediocre top end speed yeah so um again i'll plug our course so martin is the guru in this and he has led a full course on the anaerobic speed reserve and um, so if you're into this area and your and programming is important for you, I'd really highly recommend you go to Hit Science and find that course. It's excellent. And um, yeah, so but the, the general gist is to profile that individual, know what they're at, um, program, the, program the HIT workout in accordance with the profile, which would be, you know, a blend of, uh, yeah, appreciating their um yeah they're they're um what they can kind of handle and um and and putting like a monitoring system in place uh so that you um because they're they'll be susceptible to binning but they'll be um but they'll be mid mid level sort of resilient as well and they're you know usually very highly useful players too right because they've got a little bit of be- the best of both worlds they they will they will recover from these sprint intervals because they are they're hybrid uh, and they'll have a they'll have a little bit of speed, but may, maybe not your bullet player, but they'll still have a little bit of speed. So, um, but yeah, it, but again, it, it comes down to the um, knowing your athletes really, uh, putting good good monitoring around them, and um, and then yeah, and, and training them accordingly with the the right amount of high speed running. I remember high speed running usually in these team sport contexts is a prophylactic um, for creating resiliency to injury. So yeah, it's really important in these individuals that they have a regular um, dose of high intensity training in their diet, in their training diet to prevent them from getting uh, injured, uh, hamstring injury or whatever it may be. Yeah, sure, cool. Th- thanks for that. It's really um, a comprehensive uh, answer. And um, I, as I've taken us down sort of the theme of sports specific questions, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll categorize the next questions um, as so. So these are sort of more focused on a particular sport. So I'll start with one um, that you're highly qualified to answer because of your background as an endurance athlete and working with endurance athletes. And this question came in from Instagram, so I can't remember who asked it, but it, they just simply asked, is HIT applicable to ultra endurance athletes? Yeah. It's a great question. And again, I think we've kind of addressed it when I was talking about Phil Maftone, who's, again, if you look at look up Phil Maftone, you don't know him. He's like the guru in low intensity training, uh, low intensity aerobic training. And, but absolutely, even in his uh, endurance athletes, there's still, you're still hitting, you know, at least one session a week of high intensity interval training. 
Um, because yeah, you get adaptations that you won't get just on low intensity training. So you will, you will get um, a recruitment of your larger motor units, right? Even if, even in someone who's 90% slow twitch muscle fibers, they're still going to have a couple, uh, you know, fat, fast twitch muscle fibers in there. So we still want to uh, target those as well and make them more resilient. Um, we still want to, we know we get um, heart uh, stroke volume and cardiac, cardiac output to levels that we don't see in um, low intensity exercise. So we want those, uh, we want that heart remodeling to, um, to develop the big, uh, strong cardiovascular output and ventricular contractions that we know are going to um, increase VO2 max. So yet to answer your question, absolutely. We still want a small amount of progressive high intensity interval training in the diets of ultra endurance athletes. And uh, outside of performance, I know your some of your research covers more sort of health um, uh, areas as well. And is, is that a consideration as well? Because um, on my experience, I, when I've worked with endurance, uh, ultra endurance athletes, they tend to be of uh, sort of past like mid forties and sort of uh, tend to be slightly older athletes. And is that also a consideration is that we don't want to lose these sort of the, the function of the type two fibers. So by hitting some high intensity interval training, we can potentially uh, hold on to some of those. You got it. Absolutely. So um, we're all uh, unfortunately on this uh, downward trajectory of, um, uh, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it kind of uh, philosophy. So your, your fast twitch muscle fibers are going to disappear ultimately if you don't use them. And most of us don't use them, unfortunately. So you can delay the decline dis, um, of the, those larger fast twitch muscle fibers as we age by um, telling them, no, we're not, we're not slowing down. So uh, we're not, I need you guys. <laughs> yeah. If you okay. do that, so both res resistance training and high intensity interval training is, is our great ways to do that. And that's, that's going to assist us later in life when balance is so important, right? I look to my parents and my wife's parents and I see, you know, they're in their, they're in their eighties now. And I can see that balance is a real, a real issue and lack of fast twitch muscle fibers is one of those things that's contributing to that lack of balance. So, um, yeah, we want, we definitely want to, you know, and, and yeah, so again, to my wife's dad, he's having trouble getting up the stairs now. Right. So he cannot, he can, he's really lost a, a lot of uh, lower leg muscle strength. He's in, in his eighties, but it's like, that's just not, it's not what I want. It's not what I want to be when I'm, when I'm 80, if, I, if I'm blessed to get to 80, I definitely want to have good, good strength because good strength means I have a uh, good function and it's not about living longer, but it's about living good quality uh, when you are living longer. So um, yeah, super important as we age. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes I think like, particularly as a lot of these questions are heavily performance focused that, um, you know, we maybe uh, can lose sight of, of, of health along the way. And uh, I suppose that's why HIT has had a, um, a really big impact in terms of research and being applicable to, to the general population, um, particularly over the last ten, uh, a decade or so. Um, but uh, next question on um, more specific training, uh, this he just left his initials uh, EP. In Paul's book, you describe high intensity high intensity functional training really nicely. Uh, do you think this type of hits would be appropriate for endurance athletes as they can potentially improve strength and aerobic capacity using it? And just um, to qualify for anyone uh, that's un unfamiliar with this term is high intensity func high intensity functional training is basically like a CrossFit style training where you're not using typical exercises that we would for hit like running cycling swimming um using more sort of like high intensity resistance training type exercises um interspersed with body weight sort of like a crossfit style workout so i just thought i'd add that in for people that weren't aware of that type of interval training yeah it's fantastic um so uh yeah I've, i did some of that with my mate dan plues when i was uh hanging out in new zealand with him so dan's Dan runs a, a big uh, endurance 
uh, platform called an Endure IQ. So I'll pl plug that in for him. But uh, we were in his garage and doing that exact uh, type of workout. And we're both endurance geeks, right? Endurance athletes. So um, yeah, the reason why I like that as one, uh, um, you know, one workout in the, in, in the week is that it, it's hitting a bunch of different muscle groups uh, that I might not get from just swim, swim, bike and run, right? So I'm all of a sudden strengthening a bunch of other things that I just don't get elsewhere. You know, you get a lot, you get a lot of muscles worked with swimming, biking and running, um, but still there, there'll be others, some that you miss. And, um, and especially back to the, the former question we just talked about as well, right? There's fast twitch muscle fibers that are throughout that whole array of different movements. So, um, and yeah, in, um, if you're doing that in that sort of CrossFit fit manner, um, yeah, it's just, it's, um, uh, again, progression is, is key, uh, be careful. You don't do too much, but if you're, you've got good awareness of everything and how things are functioning, it's, it's a, it's a great adjunct to your, your overall program for an endurance athlete, highly recommend it. Cool. Thank, thanks for that. And that's, um, for anyone that's interested, that was in um, um, my book, Advanced Personal Training, where Paul and uh, his colleagues, uh, Cedric Leduc and uh, Martin Bouchette, um, authored that chapter. And it uh, really goes into some some depth on the, the research that's been done in that in that area, looking at sort of classifying CrossFit style workouts and where they fall on that um, sort of the types of different hit and how by manipulating rest periods, um, you can sort of hit different physiological targets. So it's a, um, yeah, thanks again for contributing to that because it was a really, I think, a, quite a novel um, a area of the book to, to explore. Pleasure, Paul. Thanks for having us there. No problem. Um, so we'll go on to the final few questions now because we're coming close to time. And, and I've grouped these as recovery type questions. Uh, so we'll start with Joe's. Uh, I think I we might have touched upon this um, in a previous question, but uh, I'll, I'll ask it. And he asked, what type of hit takes the longest to recover from? Yeah, well, it will just depend on how uh, you know deep into the well you've gone. But, um, and relative to your background as well too, right? So, it, you know, there's no, unfortunately there's no one size answer, but if you come, if you're starting from scratch, say for example, and uh, you were doing like a sprint interval training. So that's our all guns blazing. That would be pretty, that would, that would be right up there. Um, so sprint interval training, it was, uh, you know, 20 to 40 seconds all out with long recovery between. So uh, these were type five in terms of the, the hit type, where there's a large anaerobic um, res response. There's a large neuromuscular involvement. Uh, you know, a classic example of a sprint interval training might be like a wind gate test. Yeah. So these are almost repeated wind gates that you're doing. Uh, so, you know, have your, have your, um, in your bucket close by because they're <laughs> nausea inducing if you're not used to these. And, um, yeah, I, those, those take a while to, to recover from. Um, but you know, and if you are a sprint trained individual, then it won't be as, it won't take you as long. So again, context is, is so specific. So, um, we could have the, you know, the sprint trained individual be absolutely been from a long interval workout too. Right. So, um, it, it just, it, it totally depends on that, that recovery element in terms of, the background of preparation that's been done beforehand in that individual, but uh, yeah, off the couch that tends to be the the one that hits us the hits us the hardest. Yeah, and you met you mentioned previously about sort of the, the modality of exercise, whereby cycling tends to be a lower neuromuscular stress, whereas if you've got um, running and then you kind of throw in changes of direction as well, you're probably gonna suffer yeah. the next day if you've got all of those factors in there. Absolutely right. So think about, yeah, if you're doing this in the running context and you're doing, you know, repeated 400 meter sprints, say, for example, on the track, well, yeah, you think of the, uh, yeah, think of the muscle damage that you might be inducing from that if you've never done that before. So, yeah, I, I can certainly vouch for that. The, the sessions which I found the most punishing when I was doing regular football was anything where there was a lot of shuffle running. So 
um you know oh, yeah. run into a cone back again often called doggies and and that type of training because there's just sure. so many accelerations decelerations and then you're doing a high volume of it i, I used to uh kind of why i don't do pre-season training anymore I kind of dread those yeah. types of sessions <laughs> yeah for sure remember, remember the key is we don't want to do this too often so uh because again in any of these contexts if it's taking us that long to recover um then you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to repeat it again so you, you're not gonna get that repeated stimulus that you want to build that resiliency so, yeah and <laughs> that's a theme that's come through on other um with other q and a's with their experts like for example um uh, Mike Isratel when we looked at training for muscle hypertrophy and he was saying like if you go in all guns blazing just to like do as much possible and loads of muscle damage then your recovery is so long that you're not going to be able to train again which is the stimulus so it's uh it's kind mm -hmm. of the same for all training really is that you don't want to go too hard and there's a sort of sweet spot that we're trying to find exactly um the next one also comes um from Jack and he asks if you have a hit session planned for the day and your athlete is tired, is it still worth doing the session as planned? And do you have any markers to help with this decision-making process? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I see that a lot in my athletes. And basically, the it, it can be actually really good to um, encourage the athlete to experiment with both and they should intuitively know. So there's, if they're not like, start the warm up. So um, get them to start into the warm up because it's it's amazing how even if you don't, if you're feeling not that energized, um, when you start, if you just, you know, um, be turning things over and you might feel okay in 10 to 20 minutes of the warm up, and maybe start in and do, you know, start the first, uh, set of, of these and if it but yeah if it if you're really absolutely truly binned you'll know and then get them to turn it off but uh more times than not in my experience i get the comment like um yeah i'm really glad i just started that one and i really got into it after i after i got going and i'm glad i did it now so that's yeah that's what i tend to get in, in at least in my experienced athletes so Okay, cool. And then um, you, you've got uh, done quite a bit of research in uh, with heart rate variabilities. Is that something that you use with your athletes to sort of help inform training at all? Do you still use that? Yeah, yeah. It's not the be all end all, but it's one tool in the toolbox, I always say. And it's uh, it's a great one. It, your morning resting heart rate variability, very easy to measure now. Uh, lots of different devices that are out there. Athlete, HRV for training, uh, you know, uh, lead HRV. Um, who else do we have out there? Uh, Aura Ring, Whoop, like they're all, you know, whatever. Get get the one that you like and and uh, and suits. And it's like a morning measure is the best best thing. And if you're doing like a morning uh, sample of your heart rate variability, it's one extra marker that you can look at. And you never look at one single marker, but if it's if you're getting consecutive days where you're seeing a decline of your HRV, that's indi indicative of higher levels of sympathetic fight or flight stress in your, in your, um, in your body, in your system, and less of the uh, parasympathetic rest and digest uh, adaptation signal. And then, it, yeah, it, it could be one marker that you use to say, I think we're gonna take a, a, an easier week this week and just see if we can lift things back up. Cool. Um, I've I've, uh, I've had a few questions that are coming live on the Q and A. Uh, I'm conscious of time, but could we just? Uh, would you mind if we just got through these, Paul? If that's okay, it's fine. Yeah. Um, so I, I never quite know what's going to come up when they come in live, but um, I'll just have a look now. Uh, so uh, Anas asks a really good question, actually. Um, should you, or I suppose he means, do you, would you recommend doing hit all year round, or should there be a space in the season where you take a rest from it? Uh, if yes, how long does it take to lose high intensity fitness? Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, I my thought on that is it's good to take, like, say for example, you're a 
you know, an endurance athlete and you get to that last race of the season, it doesn't matter really what it is, but it's usually pretty exhaustive. And um, that's a good place to kind of leave things for a couple of weeks and just get that, just go into a, like a reset mode for two, three weeks where you're just sort of doing, you know, aerobic, mostly aerobic training. But then after that two to three week period is you're starting to um, usually feel a little bit more energetic. And then it's, then it's good after that, that time to um, yeah, introduce again, uh, sort of at least a, a regular diet of, of uh, a small bit of hit training um, in, in the program uh, on a weekly basis. And, and again, it's just a signal, right? We've been talking about signals into the body the whole, the whole time. And it's just like, it doesn't have to be a lot, but it's just like, one small high intensity stimulus like a 30 30 for example where we started as well just that yeah. yeah just do an easy even just you know small one or two sets of 30 30 um or having some something fun in there as well right a little, little fart like playing or whatever um yeah racing with with some mates but um but yeah just just a little bit where you're breathing a little bit harder say for example cool and and that's a good segue about 30 30 because uh, Sean's just asked a question. Uh, how would you go about progressing a HIT workout uh, for a short interval 30 by 30? So I guess he's asking, would you add volume or, or intensity? Yeah, again, depends on the individual and their ability, but let's say that they were, um, I'll, I'll set my, start with myself because I'm doing this exact same thing. And right now I'm actually going to go. I'm going to do my next progression. So for me, I'm doing uh, a set of uh, 30 15s actually, but uh, it wouldn't matter if it's 30 30 is as well. Um, um, but I've done like the last time last week I did just getting back. I just did, um, I just did two sets of seven 30 15s and uh, I, yeah, sorry, two sets of that. So I, and uh, I did seven 30 15s with a, a three minute break in between another one. So this week I'm gonna do three sets of 30 15s. And then next week after that, I'll do four sets of 30 15s, so, you know, set, seven, of it, seven of them in there. And what I know I'll find, cause I always find it is just, it, it feels, it's gonna feel a lot easier this week because I did it last week and, and, uh, and likewise the, the next week. So I, I progress those in blocks of seven, uh, seven or eight uh, uh, bouts or repetition, mm -hmm. and I progress the sets. And I might stop when I get to about six sets of those. That'll be that'll be enough of a of a good uh, stimulus um, where I can kind of I won't need too much more than that. And that that prepares me. Was that six like, sets of seven? Yeah, six sets of seven. Yeah, oh. which is pretty pretty solid. Um, yeah, 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 that's, that's a tough session. Yeah, and I can do that on my ergometer in the in the garage, which I'm going to do now. It's a little cold, and then or I can do that. Um, I can do that on the road as well on a hill, which is really really useful too. Oh, cool! Well, that's a nice practical back. example. So it's always good when um, guests and experts talk about what they're actually doing with their training as well. I find find that people respond are already interested in that. And uh, yeah. this is another one actually on short intervals. And sorry, I can't pronounce your name properly. Uh, I'll just say it's Diorge, I think. Um, are you using or do you use percentage of anaerobic speed reserve to prescribe short intervals? Yeah, we need to, uh, but I don't. If, if, I'm, if I'm honest, um, I'm not doing that enough now, but we that's where we want to get to. And that's why that's why we're doing the work with um, with Athletica is so that we can get um, yeah, we can get at the prescribing those as percentage, but giving like giving people an absolute like we won't give give someone the percentage, right? Don't mm. you know go at give go at eighty percent? <laughs> yeah, we'll actually give you like the either the speed uh, or power um, to to target. Um, or yeah, and and even the feel as well too, right? So, but but yeah, that can be. Uh, I would say that I'm not there yet, but that's where I want to go. Cool. Just just to finish up on that, Paul, do you want to uh, speak a little bit about what Athletica is and, and how it came about? Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. Well, so I guess the evolution of all of this stuff for me went, okay, so uh, our, um, our foundation 
journal articles that anyone can go and get um, on the on the internet. So the science and application of high intensity interval training solutions to the programming puzzle, part one and part two, sports published in sports medicine. We then went to the book right here. Um, we then went to the courses that you see on hit science, but then, we, and throughout the whole time, we just say, like, well, we, you know, can't just have a book, we have to have a course. Can't just have a course, need a technology because as all of these questions are showing, there's still so many complexities and questions and unanswered um, problems. So the app is sort of the final solution there for as a tool for individuals to be able to um, to get the help that they're sort of, that they're after. And it, it leverages AI and wearables um, to be able to give people the prescription based on who they are. So Athletica is, um, it's a, we're starting with running, cycling, and uh, triathlon as the three sports. And you can, um, yeah, you basically can go there, plug in your, um, uh, as an athlete, you plug in your race date or a coach. We have a coach version as well. You plug in your race date and uh, you connect your wearable and you have a, a program out to seven months away that's periodized. And then it adapts and moves as you go along. So based on the loading that's calculated um, for all those. So um, we've just launched our coach version and we've just launched a free course for coaches. The coach version is free, the ebook is free, and the course is free. So uh, there's absolutely nothing to lose. Go on to uh, Hit Science or Athletica. And uh, if you're a coach in there, please sign up to our, to our course and sign up to the platform. And, um, and yeah, we'd, we'd love, to, uh, love to get your feedback on, on our application. That's brilliant, Paul. And if, if you send me the links, what I'll do, I'll circulate those to everyone that's registered. So even if people not on the call now, so they can um, check those resources out. And uh, so we, we've gone, um, come up to time. I just wanted to say thanks again for for giving up your time and, and uh, providing such great nuanced answers to all these questions. Um, there were still a few that um, I didn't get around to, but I'm conscious of, of your time and everyone else's. So uh Thanks again, Paul. Really appreciate that. And um, maybe sometime we could do a, a rerun and get through the other questions. Thanks, Paul. I'd like that. Bye. See you, everyone.